Hi guys, in this video I just want to give a quick demonstration of the auto trim feature that I talked about yesterday in Highs. So I'm just going to show you some samples that I've cut in Reaper and then we'll move over to Highs, bring the samples in and I'll use the auto trim to tidy them up a bit. So if we go, let's, let, we'll go with the clarinets. I've been editing a lot of woodwind samples recently. Um, so we'll go with the, uh, the clarinet one and I'll go through my process of editing samples at some point in another video. And uh, it actually varies with every project I do. I learn something new. So usually I add that. So when I do the next project, I'm doing it in a slightly different way. Uh, but OK, so all these samples here, these are all the sustain samples. So we'll just look at those for now. And we've got three mic positions. Close, Decker and Hall. The Hall mic and the Decker mic, those are stereo samples. And uh, the Decker was actually three mics and it's rendered down to stereo samples. And the Close is mono. And then here we've got Dynamic 1, Dynamic 2 and Dynamic 3. So we recorded the uh, Instrument 3 Dynamics. And these ones in black, these are just the uh, extra takes that weren't used. So you can ignore those. Um, but anyway, we'll just zoom in and have a quick look at uh, the start position. So ignoring the blue line, which is the pitch, I'll just get rid of that for now. So we can see that the start position where I've cut the sample is here, but the actual start of the sample is at this point. And if I go to the spectral view, you can see there's quite a gap between the start of the sample and the start of the media item. And this is pretty much the same for all of them. And I don't cut them accurately, like 100% up to the start position where I'm going to want them for two reasons. One, it's faster not to do that. I don't have to go in and move each one. Um, I can be much um, more laid back about it. And the second reason is it's good to have a bit extra at the beginning so you can adjust in the sampler, whether that's contact or highs uh, or any other sampler. It's good to have that bit of adjustment room. So. That's what the samples look like in their sort of raw form. This is what I call the rough cut. So we'll just come out of there and you can see the file is actually called clarinet one rough cut. And now we'll open highs and we're actually going to drag the samples in. I've already exported the samples. So we'll open highs and we'll map the samples very quickly. I'm not going to go into too much depth about mapping the samples. So we'll add a sampler. And if I go into Actually, it's in the same folder. And there's the sustain samples. So quick look at mapping in highs. Uh, so the peaks folder, that's just for Reaper. It generates these peak files so it can show the waveform. So we can ignore that. So we've got all these files here. These are the three dynamics and the three mic positions. There's 378 files. I'm just going to drag them all in at once. And then we get, where's it gone? There we go. We get the auto mapping options for highs. So there's a few ways you can map. We're just going to go to the file name token parser. This is quite similar to what you'd be used to in contact. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, there's a few differences. I'm not going to go into details, but the important things are we've got the, uh, it's detected the note number, that's 50 there, and it's going to map that to a single key and the data type is number. You can also have it do all kinds of other things, including note name, which I know some people prefer to use, but I always use MIDI note number. And for this one here, you can see it's dynamic one and it's actually one word. There's no space between the word dynamic and the number one. And it's mapping it to the RR group. So that's round robin groups, although they're not just used for round robins, but the default behavior is round robin. So it calls them round robin groups, but in this case, they're going to be used to crossfade dynamics. Um, and now I set the data type to custom and you can see it detects the values one, two, three, even though it's one word. And that's something you can't do in contact. So I'm going to click OK. And it's asking, do I want to import the loop points? So I might as well. There's loop points embedded in these samples. And it's changing the number of round robin groups from one to three because we've got three. OK. And what I'll do very quickly is um, I'm going to merge these because we've got three mic positions in here. So I'm going to merge them all into multi mic samples. And that's something I'll explain in more detail in another video. But I'm just going to merge these 
Okay, so now we're just dealing with a single sample, and what I always do after that is just check the uh, purge state, just turn it off and on. Sometimes it needs to reload the samples. And here's our three round robin groups, uh, but we want to use them for crossfading, so I'll just enable the crossfading. And this is really nothing to do with the auto trim, it's just going to help when I want to demonstrate. Uh, oh, I'm in group two there, so let's change that. So this is just so I can differentiate between the layers that I'm mapping. You'll see how this makes um, sense in a moment. And group three. Okay. So I've just set up a crossfade there and I'm going to add CC1 modulator. There we go. So now if I move my mod wheel and press a note on my keyboard, you can see the little bar going along. So because of the way I've set this up, we can listen to individual groups. So if I move it down to there, uh, you can't actually see the value when I'm on group one for some reason, but if I move it down to there, we're hearing group one. If I move it up, I'm gonna turn the volume down a bit. Now I can hear just group two, and if I move it to the max, we're now hearing group three. So I'll just use that as a quick tool when I'm mapping samples in highs so I can uh, listen to the individual uh, layers. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the wave editor view. And again, you don't have to do it this way. We could have stayed in that view, but this is just a bit bigger. It'll be easier for you guys to see. And I prefer working in this view as well. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hit Control A to select all the samples. I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna go to the tools menu and I'm gonna select this trim sample start. It actually trims the sample end as well. And it opens this window. So the first thing I do is I zoom in a bit using this top slider. And you can select different samples to look at for your preview. Usually the first one it comes up with is fine. And then the next thing to do is set an area that it's gonna search for the start of the sample. And that's with this second slider, this max offset. And this is basically to stop it finding the start of the sample, sort of halfway through the sample um, or right near the end. So it's just to say this is the start section. So probably about there is fine. Uh, it's not going to search anywhere near there. Now snap to zero, to zero, that's to snap to a zero crossing. I usually just leave that on yes, but you can say that to no if you don't mind. Uh, it might give you more accurate results. Uh, the end threshold, that's for your release. Uh, the release of the sample, the end of the sample, I'd never touch that one. And the start threshold, that's for the beginning. And we're going to play with that in just a second. Mic position to analyze. You're almost always going to want this set to close mic if you have multi mic recordings. And the reason for that is the close mic picks up the sound before any other microphone. So the start time of the close mic is going to be earlier than the uh, Decca and wide mics. So now we're gonna play with the start threshold. I actually usually just leave this at minus 40, but if we slide it up, you can see it um, adjusts the start position in real time. And so it gives you an idea of where it's gonna place it, but um, minus 40 tends to be fine. So I'm just gonna leave it as minus 40 and then hit okay. And it gives you some information, which I never look at, I just hit okay. Okay, now um, if we just go through the samples, we can see how they've been trimmed. Now, usually what I do is I'll just go into the first group and go through all those and go to the second group. Um, and we've got this display group button down here and I'm clicking on it and nothing's popping up and that's a bug. Sometimes that happens. I can't remember how to fix it, although sometimes it doesn't happen. But the other way is to go back to this view and just change it here. And I'm just going to zoom in a bit. There we go. And now we can see the start time has been adjusted to the beginning of the sample. And that one, it hasn't, so that one I'll do manually, but we can see there's a lot of noise at the beginning of that sample. Probably breath noise. And that one's okay. That one needs to be adjusted. Adjust that one as well. So it's just a case of going through, that one's okay, that's okay. And the majority shouldn't need anything doing, but Expect to do a little bit of touch up. That green box, by the way, represents the looped area. Uh, so that's okay, that one. See, that's one where I'd probably play it back to see 
how it sounds. So I've moved my mod wheel all the way to the lowest end because we're on group one. So I'm going to play that back and I'm going to adjust that just a little bit. Yeah, that's all right. I might bring mine a bit closer, but it'll do for now. And that one I'll definitely bring in a bit closer. And now that I've filled about with them in here, I'm actually going to go back to the other way of view because I, I seem to recall if you fiddle about with the samples and go in here, yeah, this works now. So now I can carry on in here. Okay, so these all look good. Yeah. Yeah. That one I'll bring in just a touch. But you get the idea. So I just go through them all. So that's the first dynamic done. Go to the next one. These are all fine. Yep. And after a while, you'll, you'll just be able to go through them quite quickly. And you could, if you want, you see with this one, for example, if I zoom in here, some people would want to put it there and just have it right at the beginning. I find it doesn't really make a difference. Like, not an audible difference. If you find another one, uh, let's find one in a more pleasing range. Let's go to back down here. There we go. So let's play this note. Oh, still on the first dynamic. There we go. So, sounds fine to me if I move it back to there. I'm not really noticing a difference. So that's a matter of taste if you want to go in and tweak it to that degree. Uh, one thing you'll notice is when I press a key um, like that one, you're seeing it highlight in the mapping editor, but there's no cursor playing playing it back. So the cursor will only appear for the uh, first dynamic group if you're on group one. So that's just something to be aware of. It confused me the first few times I did this. And then, yeah, just go through group three and do the same process, really. And that all looks fine to me. And then once I'm done, I'll click off that. Um, I'll add a bit of crossfade time to my loops. There we go. All the loops crossfaded now. Uh, actually, no, they're not. I tell a lie. I was on group three. I should have been on all groups. There we go. There we go. So all of the loops are now crossfaded. And uh, these samples are now ready to be loaded into an instrument. This is how I actually work. I set up a project just for mapping the samples. And then I save the sample map. So I just right click there, select save sample map, and I give it a name and you can see all these sample maps I've saved. And then when I'm building my actual instrument, I can just load in the correct sample map. So if I, let's load in the sample map now. So let's actually load in the clarinets that I've actually already mapped. So. This is the one I did earlier. And you can see I went through the exact same process and the samples just come out pretty much the same. So that's the auto trim feature in highs and a little look at my uh, mapping workflow. It's been quite a while since I've mapped samples in contact, but I remember it takes a lot longer than this. And of course you've got to trim them more accurately, which uh, takes a lot more time. But hopefully um, this feature is useful to you and it'll get you more interested in highs. Uh, the paradigm of highs, as I keep saying, is a lot different to contact. So don't be put off by it. Just take the time to study uh, highs. Spend a few weeks with it, playing around. And once you really get into highs, you'll have no desire to go back to contact, except on those rare occasions when highs can't um, do what you need to do for your instrument. Okay, thank you for watching. If you found this useful, please uh, like the video and hit subscribe. Uh, share it with your friends and all that. And leave a comment if you've um, got questions or just want to comment. And I'll see you next time.